Hi again. Today we're in the North Pennines. We're on the South Tyne Trail. And this is an area so rich with heritage and history, it's unbelievable. At one time, it was on the very frontier of the Roman Empire. Then it was the home of the debatable lands, where Duke William had sent his trusted men to try and keep peace and order, the home of the border reavers. But today what we're concentrating in is a time long further in the future to that, when the Industrial Revolution, and particularly railway mania, had got a hold on the place. The 1850s found Britain at the height of empire and in its industrial might. The driving force behind their industrial power was undoubtedly the coal industry. But the coal industry needed some help to get the products to the market. And that help came in the form of railways. Now the Tyne Valley had had wagonways for at least a hundred years. Even this area in the South Tyne to the west on the other bank Lord Carlisle had had a wagonway to Tyndall Fell from 1799. But they were inefficient, they were of their day. They couldn't transport the amount of coal that was needed to drive the Industrial Revolution and to make the landowners some money. Lord Carlisle had a very progressive mine manager by the name of James Thompson. Now James was a close friend of George Stevenson, the engineer on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway and the inventor of the rocket. Now James loved steam engines, he loved locomotives, he could see the great potential, where at the time some other engineers, they favoured long inclined planes and stationary engines that hauled rope railways, but not for James. Now he encouraged Lord Carlisle to upgrade the old wagonway into a main line and then to extend that main line to the village of Midjom where the king pit was opening out. James knew that they were going to construct a railway from Newcastle to Carlisle. And the idea was to get his railway down to Brampton to meet that, that railway as it came along. It was opening up a big arterial roadway across the, the entire countryside. James's plan, obviously, was to send coal to Maryport and capitalise on the Irish market. But our story is not about that today. We're going to be looking at the mineral wealth to the east in the North Pennine Moors where they find lead, silver, gold and treasure. Pretty impressive, isn't it? That's the Lamley Viaduct. It was restored to its former glory in 1996. Now, the Newcastle to Carlisle Railway Company was formed in the mid-1820s, and bit by bit, the line progressed across the country and was opened in stages. Now, with the line under construction, many branches were built up into the various valleys, and with Alston being so rich in lead, in fact, Alston was the leader, the North Pennines, was the leader on the world stage of lead production at that time. Hard to believe when you visit today. It was mooted from the early 1840s to construct a railway from Nent Head down to Holtwistle to meet up with the Newcastle to Carlisle Railway. However, to go from Alston to Nent really was just that bit too, too much in engineering. In the past they'd tried to build an underground canal from Alston up to Nent, but that all sorts of engineering problems had occurred and it took years and years. In fact, son started the grandfather started the job and grandsons finished the job. So finally, it was decided that the railway would run from Holtwistle to Alston. It was built in two stages. From Holtwistle to Cornwood, a shaft hill where we've just been, and from Lamley down into Alston. And they didn't connect up, although both sides were running, until the year 1852 because the last obstacle, the Tyne Valley, had to be crossed and the Lamley Viaduct was the means of that crossing. Now we're not here just to talk about statistics on railways, we're here today to talk about people. Now at school we usually learned about the first railway opening being the Stockton and Darlington and then the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. Now there's a big similarity between the Liverpool Manchester and the Alston branch. When we learnt about the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, we were told about the incident with the MP, William Huskinson, that got killed on the railway on that first day, that it was a tragedy. We didn't learn about the other things that went on that day, how uh, Wellington was booed when he got into Manchester, and how the weavers of Lancashire had got an effigy of a, a weaver in a coffin, because they were suffering greatly. But, hey, Let's not get a good story passing the way of true facts and reality. 
Now on this line, it wasn't an important MP like William Huskisson that got killed. In fact, it was a young lad that got caught by the wheels of industry and died that day. And interestingly, you're not really going to learn about it in the history books. Not even in Alston, which I think is rather sad. But it really, it wasn't nearly the only tragedy that we can learn about with uh, this railway opening. Shortly after the Alston side of the line had open, opened, the Cornwood side had been opened long before that. They had a self-acting incline that ran from the hill beside me, behind me, down to the viaduct where they were still constructing it. And the, there was scaffolding and also there was a footbridge attached to the side of the bridge. Now on that fateful January day, as luck would have it, there'd been a hard frost. So the stone masons weren't at work. And that's a good job because a set of full wagons set off from the hill behind me, out of control, and crashed into the bridge, demolished the scaffolding, and took out the footbridge as well. Now then, what loss of life would there have been then, with all those stonemasons falling to the death? Perhaps it would have made the local papers, and perhaps you would have learned it in school. So let's find out more about where the line ran, and then let's meet young, young Joseph Teasdale and get to know him. Oh, and by the way, enjoy the beautiful South Tyne Valley while you're at it. Another potential really serious incident had occurred just two or three days before the wagons run away. Down in Softly Woods, somebody had fastened a big block of wood to the railway tracks. So had the locomotive hit that block of wood, it would have derailed and down a hill towards the Tyne. As luck would have it though, the locomotive was stuck at Slaggyford Station when that block of wood was discovered, so there was no loss of life. But who on earth would want to do something like that? Now restored to its former glory, it's magnificent really isn't it? Like a hidden gem of the South Tyne Valley. It consists of nine arches, although you can't see them all because of the trees. And at its highest, it stands 110 feet above the South Tyne. It's built across the, uh, the Wind Dyke. Winston is a hard quartz dolerite stone that's found quite a lot up in the North Pennines. In fact, the Romans built part of the Roman wall on it up at Caulfield's Quarry. So it's a good foundation. The deepest pillar is uh, 30 feet down below the riverbed. The other's been about 20 to 17 feet. So if you ever get a chance, it's well worth a walk along the South Tyne Trail to come and see this. And hopefully now you're going to see a few photographs of what it was like in its former days. Well, perhaps not the viaduct, but certainly the stations either side of it, at Coldmood and Lamley. And where the uh, Lamley line from the colliery connected to the main Alston branch. The Olsen branch operated as two different lines either side of the Tyne until the Lamley Viaduct was finished. The viaduct itself was built from both sides simultaneously. All the stone for the Olsen side came from a quarry at Slaggerford, whilst the stone for the Cornwood side came from a quarry at Barden Mill. Now the idea of this railway wasn't just to transport the vast mineral wealth of Alston Moor and the North Pennines, but it was also to provide the necessities for a market town. Now Alston, if you know Alston more, Alston's situated at least 20 miles, 25 miles away from anywhere. And although in the 1820s they built three separate turnpike roads to connect it with Penrith, Hexham and Carlisle, it was still a long way to transport those goods and bring in the necessities. So a railway was really the answer. And one of the biggest necessities for a town was coal. Now Alston possess its own coal mines, its, its own coal measures, but they were different, they were anthracite, and back in those days they were looked at rather derogatory. It was, Olsen coal was known as cra coal or crow coal. They didn't really fully realise the potential that anthracite has. All right, they burned it on fires, they mixed it with clay to make what they called cats and burned it the best they could, and it was also used to fire the lime kilns. 
But the coal that we found here in the Naworth coal field and the Cornwood coal field was from the middle coal measures. There was six or seven seams of good bitumous coal, some of them reaching a height of six foot. But the old man didn't take them all. He only took three or four because he said the others, well, they, they weren't profitable because they were only about two foot six high. <laughs> two foot six. I think my generation of colliers, we just sold our grandma for two foot six of coal. Very early in the morning of January 1852, these streets would have rung to the sound of excited clogs as everybody rushed down through Harper Town to Lamley Station to watch the first locomotive leave for Alston. Now we can't get access today to Lamley Station, it's on private ground, but we can imagine what it must have been like. At seven o'clock, a band left Alston and walked three miles out of town to, to catch the, the, where there was a railway engine waiting for them, a locomotive, so that nobody in Alston would catch sight of it. The locomotive was decorated with buntings and that brought the band up to Lamley. Now at Lamley Station, there was three carriages waiting full of railway company dignitaries and all those who'd been lucky enough to get tickets for the ride. Behind them was a set of cauldron wagons laden with coal, proudly emblazoned with James Thompson and Sons on the side. The train was put together and excitedly, with a band playing, it set off down towards Alston. So here we are in the village of Slaggiford, and this is where young Joseph Teasdale grew up. Well, actually, he grew up a mile or so further up the fell at a place called High Luxley. There's a little community of farms up there on Slaggiford Fell End. And in 1841, we find young Joseph living with his dad, Joseph, a stonemason, his mother, Anne, his brother, Thomas, who was a lot older than him, he was a stonemason as well, and there's his sister, Anne, Hannah, and Isabella. Now Joseph's mum and dad were already getting on in years by that time. His father was 50 and his mum was 60. So the next time we find him in 1851 on the census, just a year before he died more or less, just less than a year actually, his mum and dad had passed away and Joseph was living with his sister Anne here in the village itself. Now Anne had married young uh, Thomas Ridley who was a grocer and Thomas had took the younger children on as his own. In fact he's down on the census as their stepfather. So this is where young Joseph would have been as a 15 year old that day when he made his way up towards Slaggiford station to jump on the train with his mates to go to Walsall. Now I'd like to think that Joseph and his mates just jumped on the train as stowaways. I don't know if they had any tickets for it or not. Boys will be boys, won't they? But anyway, Train set off from Slaggerford down to Olson with a band playing, party atmosphere, and the four lads, Joseph, his mate Smith, and two others, had got onto a, a truck, one from the end, so they were on the last but one truck going down into Slaggerford. All excited as lads would, eh? Well, I hear the train a coming, and it's coming round the bend. I ain't seen the sunshine. <laughs> Out of Slaggerford the train went heading towards Alston. By this time they've worked out that well your egg wasn't going to explode when the train went over 30 mile an hour. But next to the back there was Joseph and his mates clinging on, really excited. We can see today the train's got in nice and safely. But that wasn't the case 170 years ago, as this place was absolutely thronged with crowds. Let's go a bit further up the line, I'll tell you exactly what happened.
see there's a natural cutting here through the sky limestone. And this formed a natural terrace. Back in 1851, crowds stood all along here like a football terrace. As you get further down where that shed is there, it gets very high. You can imagine the noise of the band and the crowds probably on the track as well as the train approached the station. Now you can imagine what it must have been like, can't you, at 10.30 as a train complete with band playing came into the station. All the sides here lined with people, people perhaps even spilling onto the railway lines. Maybe one or two had had a pint too many already at half past ten. Now because of the crowds, the train came to a halt as he tried to manoeuvre his way through and clear everybody out of the way because he didn't want any accidents. But when he stopped, the four excited young lads from Slagiford stood up on the wagon and they were looking to see what was going on. But when the train set off again with a jerk, poor Joseph fell backwards. Now as he fell back over the back of the wagon between it and the final, final truck, he reached up and grabbed his mate Smith, just trying to get a hold. And sadly, he pulled Smith down as well. As Smith fell, the third lad grabbed hold of Smith's legs and stopped him from going any further. And the fourth lad from Slagiford, well he fell over, but he didn't fall off. Now then, poor Joseph, well, he was on the floor on the rails itself and the train ran over both his legs and severed them, almost severed them. Young Smith, well, he was slightly luckier because the train passed along his arm and it took all the skin off down to the bone, but he was still alive. Well, both were alive, but it was looking really bad for Joseph. Joseph was picked up, some very rough first aid done to him and he was brought to the low buyer inn that was run by Mr Cranston at the time. The doctor was called and he did what he could. But sadly, at one o'clock the next morning, young Joseph died of his injuries. His mate Smith, well, he fared better. They sent for Dr. Bell, the bone setter, and they put his kind of put his arm back together, and he survived. What life-changing injuries he had, we don't know. Certainly, the day that set off so happy and hopeful in a few short hours had ended in tragedy. Well, the wheels of industry, certainly British industry, weren't going to stop because one young lad had lost his life and another had life-threatening injuries. Certainly not. In fact, following the incident, the town had got together and actually bought all the coal that came from Lamley Colliery to give to the poor. So all the coal was loaded into, a, into carts, 70 carts altogether, and a band of horses decked out with buntings and ribbons pulled all the carts up the front street. You can imagine the party going on. Surely the band was still playing and one thing and another as well. It would have been a real old party. And seeing as festivities had started at half past ten in the morning, you can imagine what some of them would have been like. In fact, the railway company gave several half barrels to the navvies and also to the townspeople. And according to the newspapers, oh, we'll just let this car go past. According to the newspapers, there were friendly fights broke out all over the town with the navvies and that. The friendly fights? Yeah! I'd be just like growing up in the 1970s in East Lancashire, going for a night out in Rottenstall and having one or two friendly Doc Martins aimed at your head at high speed. Just hijinks, lads. Well, that brings us to the end of our little narrative on the sad story of Joseph Teasdale on the, the joyous, supposedly joyous day of the opening of the Alston Railway. Sadly, you'll find no memorial anywhere for Joseph in Olsen. There's no blue plaque. There's not even any little blast brass plates on a park bench down by the railway station. Poor little shepherd boy from Narsdale, gone and sadly forgotten. But hopefully, that might change. Anyway, see you next time and thanks for watching.